Bon après-midi à tout le monde. Je m'appelle Lyle Dick. Je suis historien côte ouest avec Parc Canada en Vancouver. And uh, today's session deals with historic parks and sites. And we two, have two very distinguished speakers uh, from Australia and Canada who will be exploring dimensions of this topic. And uh, of course, as we heard in the presentations by Jerry and David on Canada and Pilvi and Paul on Finland and Australia, historic sites are among the most popular venues uh, for people to access the past and apparently the most trusted. So I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm hoping that our presenters will shed some light on that uh, issue. Uh, today, our presentation, uh, presenters include Laura Jane Smith and Andre Charbonneau. So I'll introduce them both now. They will then speak. I've given them each a maximum of 30 minutes, and I'll wave the red flag at the five minute mark, and then hopefully we'll have about 20 minutes for discussion. Laura Jane is an Australian Research Council Future Fellow at the Australian National University. She works in the area of heritage studies and is editor of the International Journal of Heritage Studies and co-general co editor of the series Key Issues in Cultural Heritage. Previously, she held the position of reader in heritage studies at the University of York, where she directed the MA in Cultural Heritage Management program for nine years. She taught Indigenous Studies at the University of New South Wales and Heritage and Archaeology at Charles Stewart University. She also worked as a heritage consultant in southeastern Australia for a number of years. Her pre presentation today is entitled Cultural Heritage and the Mediation of Identity, Memory and Historical Narratives. Andre Charbonneau a responsable des services historiques de Parc Canada pour le Québec. Il s'intéresse à l'art militaire colonial au Canada depuis plusieurs années. Sa carrière à Parc Canada l'a amené à développer une vaste expertise dans le domaine de la conservation et de la mise en valeur du patrimoine culturel. Il est en outre associé au département d'histoire de l'Université Laval où il co-dirige régulièrement les thèses de deuxième et troisième cycle dans ses champs d'expertise. And Andre has long been associated with research and publication on Canada's National Historic Sites and actively engaged in historical production, not only in scholarly contexts but with the general public. I must say, à Parc Canada, nous sommes très fiers de ses contributions à la patrimoine canadien et uh, de, de la monde. And uh, his presentation today is entitled Le lieu historique national de la Grosse Ile et le Memorial des Irlandais, entre la définition du discours historique et de la protection ainsi que la diffusion des valeurs patrimoniales en cause. Lord Jane. Right. Well, thank you, Lyle, for that introduction, and, and thank you too to the uh, conference organisers, particularly Jocelyn, for inviting me here today. Much appreciated. I'm enjoying myself immensely. Um, as Lyle says, I work in the area of, of heritage studies. I'm not a historian. But my work has been concerned with the re re-theorisation of heritage as a subjective political and cultural process involved in the negotiation of, ed of identity, place and memory. This challenges the idea um, of heritage as material object and argues that heritage is a moment or a process of constructing or reconstructing cultural and social values and meanings. It is an embodied performance in which we identify the values and cultural and social meanings that help us make sense of the present. Is it too high? I am short. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a performance of identity and a, and a performance in, in which we negotiate um, sense, a sense of, of physical and social place. Heritage, uh, heritage making occurs through the negotiations we undertake around the decisions we make to preserve or not certain <coughs> physical places, objects or traditions and the ways these are then exhibited and managed. 
They also occur in the way that visitors engage or disengage with these things. But what is important to note is that heritage is not the historic monument. It is not the artefact or place, but rather the activities that occur at and around these places and objects. These places are given value by the act of naming them heritage and, the, and by the processes of heritage negotiations and recreations and, and creations that occur at them, while they also lend a certain sense of occasion to the cultural productions that occur at them. Heritage, I argue, is a discourse. It's a discourse which is involved in the legitimisation and governance of historical and cultural narratives and the work that these narratives do in maintaining or negotiating societal values and the hierarchies that these underpin. My research is particularly focused on the heritage making of visitors and, and the way history in the past is, re is remembered in the context of particular political and social needs and debates. Thus my work is concerned not, with, not only with illustrating the heritage process or the heritage moment, but also identifying the personal and wider cultural and political consequences of heritage making. The paper reports on an ongoing four-year project funded by the Australian Research Council to explore the memory and identity work that people undertake while visiting heritage sites and, muse heritage sites and museums in both Australia and the United States. Oh. Sorry, I forgot that wasn't up. Right, there we go. Um, it builds on a similar project I've already, under, uh, already completed in England and which was undertaken between 2004 and 8. And this slide shows the sites in England that, at which I have undertaken visitor surveys or visitor interviews, I should say, and those that I'm have so far completed in Australia and, and uh, the US. Um, right. Now the project concerns the exploration of how and why visitors to sites and museums engage with the histories they choose to visit and the use they make of both their visit and the past on view to understand the present or particular social and political issues in the present. To this in, end, I have been interviewing visitors firstly to sites and museums that reflect national or nationalising histories and narratives, and secondly to those that subvert or offer alternative histories uh, and, and narratives, or uh, sorry, alternative histories and, and heritage, I should, I should say, to national narratives. Thus, I'm also under, I've also been undertaking interviews at sites of labour or working class histories, immigration museums, sites and exhibitions of African enslavement, and sites exhibiting indigenous histories and heritage. To date, the data consists of just over 2,500 interviews from England, over 600 so far from Australia, and over 300 collected this year in the United States, with fieldwork continuing in both the USA and Australia next year. So my task today is to draw out some of the key themes that are emerging in this data, themes that illustrate the, perform the performance and consequences of heritage making. Now the interviews consist of a number of demographic questions to determine amongst other measures age, gender, occupation and distance travelled and so on. These are followed by a core of 12 open-ended questions, although depending on the site or, or museum in question, further questions are often, are often added. Responses to the open-ended questions are recorded with, the, of course, the permission of the interviewee. Interviews are generally administered just before people exit the museum or site, and, um, and all interviews are, as I said, recorded and then transcribed and read through to identify themes. Each question is then according to the themes that emerge in the read-through, and these codes are used to derive descriptive statistics, and cross-tabulations are taken against the demographic variables. So, turning to the themes, um, the first theme I want to talk about is what I've called registers of engagement. Now, it's a prosaic observation that individuals will engage differently with a particular aspect of history and that different sites may engender varying levels of engagement. However, measuring different levels of engagement reveals the limitations of much of the heritage and museum interpretation literature that draws on educational studies that argue deep engagement is more significant than shallow engagement. However, I found, and I'll illustrate as I go along, that some visitors can be quite shallow, but nonetheless such engagement does important cultural and political work. 
while some deep engagement can generate a lot of emotional feeling, but does not necessarily go far in developing critical insight for the visitor. Deep and shallow visitor engagement can also be either conservative reactionary or liberal progressive. However, understanding registers of engagement is important for understanding firstly the emotional and intellectual investments that visitors make, may make in their visits, secondly the, way, well, the ways emotions and critical insights interact, and thirdly the meanings that are subsequently rehearsed or constructed during visits. Now the second theme I want to draw attention to is that of reinforcement. Now, much of the literature identifies the significance of museums and heritage sites as places where learning uh, does, or at least should, occur. Indeed, 33% of those so far interviewed nominate that they come to sites and museums for educational reasons. However, of those so far interviewed in response to the question, has anything you've seen or heard today or read today uh, changed your views about the past or the present? 83% have said either no or that their understanding or views or indeed feelings have been reinforced, while 11% nominated that they had gained some more information, 6% said that their views had actually been changed or that they had had some form of epiphany. Now, of this later 6%, a significant proportion were visitors to, at Labour History Museums, which is an interesting observation. The overall results here are reflective, I think, of the degree to which people, despite the fact that a third of those interviewed nominated um, educational reasons for their visits, appear to be seeking reinforcement of previously held knowledge, views and values. So you're going to see a lot of these quotes. I'll let you, um, I'll let you have a read yourself. <coughs> And I want to note here too that reinforcement, the word reinforcement comes up again and again and again in response to a lot of the different questions I ask, but it is not a word that I use in the interviews. This is a word that's coming organically um, out, of, out of the uh, interviews. So it's been used un, unprompted. So people are both seeking and, and then seeing affirmation of their sense of self, the value and the values that underpin these. And they're seeking and seeing affirmation of established understandings of the other as well. Now, at some of the English country houses and at the Australian Stockman's Hall of Fame, at which I did surveys and which are sites of national storytelling, there have been some attempts, while I was surveying, to um, challenge, to include information that challenged some of the received national narratives. However, it's interesting to note that these interventions were often either ignored or simply not noticed by visitors who unconsciously blanked these interventions out. It's also important to note that quite shallow emotional and intellectual engagement can still reinforce as much as deep emotional engagement or as deep, as deep engagement. Now, the degree to which museums are seen as reinforcing feelings and knowledge may be an element, perhaps, in why these institutions are seen as trustworthy. Okay, the emphasis uh, on reinforcement does not mean, however, to say that learning does not occur. However, under the theme of learning, one of the key things that is learnt is the art of visiting and what the performance of visiting means to one's identity and sense of place. Parents accompanied by children often report that they wanted their children to Indeed, middle-class parents in particular are astoundingly uniform in nominating that they want their children to appreciate how hard it was and how lucky they are now. And out of this uniformity emerges a sense that children are learning to not only appreciate the past, but more importantly, are learning to both appreciate the visit and how to visit. 
At one of the museums I was working at recently, a staff member undertaking observational work of visitors noted that many younger people did not know how to visit, she said. She noted they rushed from um, display to, di to display. A pro process, she went on to note, often cur cur curtailed uh, by attentive parents teaching their children to behave correctly in the museum. Now, learning the museum or heritage performance, however, is a statement of identity. Museums and heritage sites are often places where visitors expect to see people like themselves, a point that emerges again and again with, uh, in the interviews, where visitors, um, sorry, emerges again and again in the interviews. For some, this performance becomes almost ritualistic, with some visitors, particularly to house museums in all three countries, noting that they obsessively visit such places but can't explain why they do so. As one Yorkshire man explained to me, heritage was, for him, historic identity, country houses and Englishness, coming here with my mum and dad when I was a kid. This tradition of heritage visit visiting was something, he informed me, he was introducing his own children to. Visiting was part of his heritage. Learning in this context is about acculturation, a process actively pursued by a number of immigrant Australian visitors to one Australian house museum and one person characterised this as <coughs> Here visiting became a civic duty to demonstrate commitment to a new Australian identity. She draws connections between her own experiences and those of early settlers and how they survived. And learning to survive perhaps here has a, a, a double meaning. Now important in understanding the theme of learning is the theme of authenticity. Important events of learning, especially deep understanding or significant changes of view, tended to occur when people could apply a relatively high degree of emotional intelligence to the performativity of their visit. visit. Now, significant in facilitating emotional intelligence is the, is the idea of um, emotional authenticity. Sites and museums were often deemed to be authentic not in any sense of the word that an archaeologist or a historian might use it, but because the feelings such sites induced felt real. This emotional authenticity could be used in three ways. Firstly, to uncritically um, uphold particular views or legitimise nationalising narratives. Secondly, to critically interrogate and renegotiate received narratives. Or thirdly, to deepen understanding of the experiences of others. In the latter two cases, emotional authenticity required pairing with a relatively high quotient of um, emotional intelligence. Now, the following is an example of a couple renegotiating received narratives at the International Slavery Museum in uh, Liverpool, England. In this interview with a woman and her husband, they continually made statements such as, I'm not what you call intelligent. However, they offered quite critical insights about the legacy of racism born out of the history of British enslavement. These insights emerged out of their empathetic anger at the histories that they were exploring in the museum. The ability to empathise and to use empathy imaginatively was often the point at which people not only began to engage deeply intellectually, but also stopped seeking reinforcement and attempted to understand the other. Now, what is interesting here is that the, is that class and educational background appear to have uh, appear to have some consequence for empathy and emotional intelligence. Middle class respondents are more likely, and I stress this is a tendency and not an absolute measure or correlation. 
Middle class re respondents are more likely to use platitudes when confronted with highly negative emotive to topics. And by platitudes, I mean simple statements that go nowhere, that lack any emotional currency or insight, such as, it was different in the past, uh, it, it was hard in the past, rather than statements, it was hard in the past and I'm lucky to be alive now. Platitudes often work to close down or deflect emotion and tend to lead to the speaker main, making fewer self-reflexive observations. The point here is that high, intellectual, sorry, high educational attainment does not necessarily correlate with emotional intelligence. Interviews with, with visitors at museums of labour and immigration, which do not draw as significantly from middle class audiences than other museums and heritage sites, are overall more actively engaged and critical, with interviewees using their visits to make active social commentary far more frequently than visitors at sites and museums representing uh, nationalising narratives or contentious histories dealing with um, enslavement or, or indigenous colonial histories, and which in turn um, tend to have a more middle class visitor profile. Now, this is, this is also, of course, a consequence of the fact that many visitors to museums of labour and immigration tend to be visiting their own or familial histories, histories that are often nationally marginalised or excluded. Those visiting museums with nationalising narratives are, of course, also visiting self to some extent, but in these contexts, there is less cause or need for critical commentary. To understand why this occurs, I need to, the, I need to turn to the themes of remembering and forgetting. Remembering is a key theme in the data. Not only are people actively engaged in collective and individual remembering, they are also laying down memories of their own visits that, that, they will themselves, that will themselves be remembered in ways that will generate new meanings long after their visits. Contrary to much of the literature on heritage, reminiscing and nostalgia can be used in affirming ways to understand and explore the past in the present. For instance, and these examples come from English uh, sites of uh, labour history. Linked to this process of reminiscing was also a remembering of the political and social values of organised labour and working communities. Many of those interviewed at labour and immigration sites use their reminiscing and affirming nostalgia to self-consciously remember, this is important, to self-consciously remember political and cultural values. Now a similar process also occurs in, goes on at sites depicting consensus or nationalising narratives, although what is often remembered is far more conservative. However, in the process of remembering that occurs at such sites, the underlying values are taken for granted and are recollected as a matter of, of course rather than self-consciously. In this process, forgetting becomes a significant theme, as the lack of self-conscious remembering correspondingly allows a deeper forgetting of negative aspects of history and of the potential diversity of historical narratives and identities. Now, to illustrate this, I want to give you a quick glimpse into visitor responses to the um, Stockman's Hall of Fame at Longreach, Queensland in Australia. As the name suggests, Longreach is an isolated town some 1,200 kilometres from the city of Brisbane with not a lot in between. It is located in the outback, the arid and mythical heartland of Australia that speaks to origin myths of settlement as opposed to the alternative narr narrative of colonial invasion of Aboriginal land. Now, the visit to the Hall of Fame was often defined as a pilgrimage by visitors and that getting to the hall, which was often a, a long car, car trip, getting to the hall was as much a part of the cultural performance of the visit as was visiting the hall's exhibitions. Many spoke of the effort it took to get there, as this effort was a demonstration of their commitment 
to what the hall meant to them. And what the hall meant was real Australia. The hall represented real Australia uh, that made people feel made them feel proud to be Australian. And as the last quote jokingly illustrates, these emotions were deeply felt. And yes, she is narrating the fact that she was crying. And she was not the only visitor to tear up. The point here is that the emotional authenticity of the hall and the journey through the outback to get there was a performance of deep engagement and remembering of Australian nationalism and national identity. Uncritically incorporated in this remembering were certain values of perseverance, strength, fortitude, honesty, and so on. However, what is actively forgotten in the, this performance or pilgrimage is that Australia is intensely urban, with only 12% of their population actually living in the so-called uh, outback or bush, while 77% of us live in towns or cities within 50 kilometres of the coast. The multicultural diversity of urban Australia is actively forgotten here, and indeed some people called for the enculturation of city people, as they were termed, and immigrants by getting them to make the pilgrimage, as these, pe as these people were um, demanding. All heritage is, of course, both inclusive and exclusive, but it is particularly exclusive when nationalising narratives are being remembered. In the performances of remembering national narrative, in, in the performances of remembering national narratives, there is often a sense of deep commemoration, if not worship, what Cameron and Gatewood referred to as numinous. The deep reverence illustrated at the Stockman's Hall of Fame is also evident in interviews from English country houses and the presidential house in the US, at which I have recently been interviewing. Now, while deep emotional engagement can fuel forgetting, so too can bland shallowness, shallowness or neutral emotional engagement. As already noted, emotional, uh, emotional neutral and platitudinal responses can shut down empathy and imagination and, and the imagination needed to critically engage. Now associated with forgetting and remembering is the theme of recognition. As the philosopher Nancy Fraser argues, the politics of recognition is a new form of political negotiation that developed in the latter part of the 20th century. Both the recognition and misrecognition by dominant sectors of society of the legitimacy or otherwise of the different histories and experiences of politically marginalised groups is understood as having material and symbolic consequences. Recognition becomes vital in helping marginalised interests to gain parity of participation in policy negotiations over the distribution of resources. In exhibitions dealing with enslavement in England, African-Caribbean British respondents were often actively using their visits to assess the degree of recognition given to their historical and contemporary experiences of discrimination. Certain groups of visitors thus used the museums and heritage sites as barometers for testing and evaluating wider societal recognition and misrecognition, as is happening here. Interestingly, this was also done by rural Australians at the, the uh, Stockman's Hall of Fame that I was just talking about, who not only used the hall to reaffirm and legitimise settlement origin myths, but also used the visit to affirm their anger at what they saw as the misrecognition by urban Australia. <coughs> 
and it's hard to give the impression of the anger and frustration that underlies this and the previous quote, but I assure you it's all too evident in the audio recordings. Now the last theme I want to uh, look at takes me back to the ideas of registers of engagement, uh, to note that there are also registers of disengagement. Disengagement can be quite passively undertaken, but it also can be quite active with visitors engaging in active strategies to close down empathy and the imagination. These strategies tend to be deployed when, uh, to de sorry, to de be deployed, I'm trying to say, when sense of self or sense of place is threatened. As already mentioned, the use of platitudes is one way uh, to passively disengage. However, in the case of those threatened or confronted by histories of enslavement, histories of indigenous colonisation or immigration discrimination, five specific discursive devices are used across all three nations to close down emotional and intellectual engagement. And these examples actually come from uh, England, from, from um, those who self-identified as white British visitors to exhibitions dealing with enslavement. But as I say, they're reproduced in Australia and uh, the, the US when, when people are dealing with things that are threatening their sense of self. And these five, what are five dec really self-sufficient arguments are um, you cannot turn back the hands of time, moral values were different in the past and the present, uh, everyone was in, in, involved in it. It wasn't just my cultural group. Everyone was, you know, it was, it was just, you know, man's in humanity to man sort of stuff. Um, blaming the victim or, or blaming a, a particular group. Uh, or it, in this last case, um, it, it, this last case it's, it's an issue of class. You know, it wasn't my um, econ socioeconomic class that, that uh, engaged in this. It was the, uh, another or it may refer to other sort of groups, ethnic groups, whatever. So these five discursive devices or self-sufficient arguments have been identified by social scientists across a range of Western countries and are examples of, uh, it's argued, covert racism. They work very effectively to emotionally and intellectually distance the speaker from any cha challenge the museum or heritage site may offer to the speaker's desire to reinforce their sense of, of self and their existing views about the past and the present. So, in conclusion, the work I'm doing is attempting to illustrate the range of ways that users, that users of heritage sites and museums engage with heritage making. It demonstrates that we cannot assume what meanings or messages visitors take away from such sites or that the visit is necessarily or primarily about education or learning. It also illustrates that visitors are active agents in meaning making, even when passively engaged. Visitors are nonetheless, un, are nonetheless in these instances undertaking cultural work and producing meaning within and by their visit. This work is also demonstrating that heritage is a discourse that facilitates the negotiation of history into not only simply publicly understandable or, or digestible accounts of the past, but rather this discourse allows people to rework or affirm certain historical narratives and most importantly to emotionally invest in certain narratives. This process of investment itself does work in not only defining individual and collective self and the other, but also in underpinning the social and political values that drive social inclusion and exclusion. Thank you very much for listening.